Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Construction Project Management Principles and Tips. Today we're going to be taking a page from Lean Construction, and we're going to be discussing variation and how it affects your construction projects, probably without you even realizing it. We'll walk through a Parade of Trades example, which is widely used in lean construction training to help people better understand how variation works and how it impacts your projects. So I'm gonna start off with a little bit on the standard uh, constraints that we see in project management and that we kind of wrestle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Especially in construction projects, we've got time, cost, quality, safety, and scope. These are pretty standard stuff. Uh, safety would be something specific for construction projects. And I like to flip them around and call them goals as well. You know, you have a project and you have a time frame that you're trying to meet or beat, or you have a budget that you're trying to meet or beat. You have a quality expectation that you want to meet so that you can get paid for the work that you do. And of course, you have expectations around safety and goals around safety to ensure that you have good morale on your project and nobody hurt nobody gets hurt everybody that starts the day gets to go back home with their families and we have a defined set of drawings and specifications which is telling us what we need to do of course we try to do all of these and balance them out and um, that can be challenging and we'll talk a little bit about that you know just to get a little sense of how they interrelate to each other Time and quality. If you fall behind on time, you rush things. I always remember when I was acting director at my college, George Brown, and I was looking after technologies, project management for a new building. We had a building that was supposed to be built by that coming academic year, the September, and it was about three months behind schedule, six months to go. The problem is we didn't have a plan B really where we were going to put those extra students. So uh, it was rushed somewhat and it ended up that we, you know, it's a good building to walk around and look at quality issues. This was way back uh, around when in Ontario we had an extra grade 13 and we got rid of it. And so we had an extra cohort, a couple of thousand students coming that year. So yeah, if things get rushed, uh, you know, quality goes down quality goes down you fall behind time you rush things and that um, becomes either a lot of rework uh, because you have to fix them or it never maybe really gets as good as it could have been uh, goals constraints uh, so when we think about scope and cost well this is pretty easy so if you don't have a really well established uh, you know set of drawing specifications client keeps adding things to it when you add things, it's going to add to cost. That kind of we intuitively we know that that makes sense, right? But the last one here is probably the most interesting. This is where we look at uh, we look at time and cost. And time and cost, of course, if we fall behind, we want to make up that time, or somebody wants uh, this done faster, you know, than you would have expected. Well, that usually involves a bunch of steps, right? It means that we probably have more people on site than we normally would. We probably haven't optimized the crew sizes, so we're not getting maximum productivity and efficiency out of the crews. Maybe they're working long hours, so again, they're tired, they're you know more apt to make mistakes, more apt to have accidents. All these things tend to happen uh, when that goes on. So. We run into that as well. The reason this is also interesting is there's a certain point where it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to finish on time. And we call that the impossible zone in project management terms. At a certain, you know, you can throw all the extra money you want, but putting more people on it may only make it later, really, because they're in each other's way. Um, stack effect, as it's known in project management terms. So there's this old saying that says time, cost, quality, pick any two, but you can't have all three without impacting at least one of the others. So this is kind of you know traditional thinking when we think about time, cost, quality. So what I wanna to propose today and what the lean community uh, largely says about this is that perhaps we can try for all three. Let's try for all three. And that involves a lot of things. There's a lot of things in lean construction. Con traditional construction methods have a ton of waste. 
before COVID, 70% of projects were over budget and over time. And, you know, with COVID, it's probably closer to 100%. Uh, but uh, that's supply chain issues, which again is another big area for lean discussions. Uh, but we can think about if we're involved earlier in the process, like it really, in my mind, when I think about lean, uh, doing better to try to impact all three, then it's also trying to change the contract model that we're dealing with so that it's not as adversarial, uh, that the incentives are there to, for the team. You know, it's based on how the project does, not how individual trades do. And that's a big part of this parade of trades uh, simulation that comes out. You know, trades tend to optimize for themselves because the incentive is there for them. You know, in a lump sum contract, they've got a total price that they put in and if they can get in and get out, they can make a profit. If they take longer and it, they're held up and they have to do rework and all these other things, then they don't make a profit. So the incentives in a lump sum for sure are there for the individuals to optimize. The problem with that is some trades win and some trades lose. I had this example that was told to me by a very senior person and they were saying, you know, there was this uh, project where there were drywallers and not to pick on drywallers, but it's, it's a good example. And so they had promised so many resources, so many people trades there uh, for, let's say it was for a two month period. Well, the first month they sent a token amount, maybe two or three people, and they really needed about 15 or 20 people. So they were just kind of making an appearance, but they weren't really doing much and they were way, way behind and they needed to get this done. So of course, the last four weeks, probably the last three weeks, they blitzed the place. So they brought like 40 or 50 drywallers and they just totally blitzed the place and they finished. And so the drywall trade was all like high five. We finished on time. We did everything we, you wanted. The problem was every other trade that was on that site, those three or four weeks, couldn't get anything done because it was overrun with the drywallers. It was, they'd taken over with the drywall everywhere, with their people everywhere, and it was really causing a disruption in the rest of the work. Well, that particular trade is looking at it like they won. The rest of the trades are looking at it like they lost. The GC, well, it kind of depends, but it definitely because of the pushback they would get and maybe a pile of claims saying that there was extra costs involved because other trades were delayed not what you want. You want a much more predictable and reliable flow on your projects and you don't want to create winners and losers. If we all work collaboratively together, you can have more more winners, like everybody can win in that case. And so that's kind of changing a little bit from traditional thinking, right? Uh, especially with the trades aspect. Now, if you can have incentives in the contract, like an integrated project delivery model, where there's a sharing of a profit pool, then there's incentives there for people to actually collaborate and to get the best flow on the project. So what gets you the best results on your project, this sort of handoff in a relay, you know, it's not that this person here is super fast and then they drop the baton or they run past this person because they're not ready up to speed yet and then everybody else passes them once you drop the baton, right? Um, it's that you've got a really good transition between the trades, a nice smooth transition. This is another part of lean which we could get into but maybe not today. Conditions of satisfaction. What does this person need? They need a smooth transition handing off of that um, baton. So point speed of individual trades does not get you the best product, the best timing on your projects, the best flow on your projects. What that does is it creates that instability when different trades are going at different speeds than what was expected. And so there's like a ripple effect that comes across and you have variation. And that's the key point here is variation. Getting all the trades on the project to go as fast as they can on each task, that's point speed. But it's not going to happen that way. You want more reliability, system reliability built in. So planning the work so that every handoff happens as it was promised is much more important. It's much more important that way. So that's a big part of it. So this uh, parade of trade simulation that is used, uh, as I said, in lean training, 
I'll just go over it and uh, hopefully you'll get the gist of it. I'll try to leave some links. Um, George Zettel of uh, Turner Construction, I came across these videos on YouTube and they're, they're very good. It seems like when you search it, it doesn't pop up, but I, I can't remember exactly how I uh, came across them. But they're very well done. I guess he's doing it with a group of Turner site supers and PM and they kind of go through this simulation. I've done this myself with lean training with the a ACG and they, they tend to do the same thing, but it's usually a condo tower. Uh, same idea though. It's, it's the same sort of repetition of work that you have going on. So they have this where they have poker chips and there's 35 uh, poker chips and each poker chip represents a classroom being renovated. So you got 35 classrooms to be renovated. Each trade rolls the dice, right? So they have a, a series of trades that are working on these classrooms and each trade gets to roll the dice and there's a single dice and they represent how what the number is represents how many rooms they get their work done in a week so if it's a rough in of plumbing then they roll a five that means they get five classrooms done in one week if they roll a one they get one classroom done if they roll a six they get six classrooms done so and so on so each dot they put a dollar value you could put any dollar value but they put a dollar value of a thousand dollars so what is the average of the rolls of the dice? Well, that's a mathematical thing. You can just add up one plus two plus three. So for each side or face of the dice, you add it up and that adds up to 21. There's six sides divided by six. So the average should be three and a half classrooms per week. So how many weeks will it take each trade to finish? What would you predict to finish their work on 35 classrooms? Um, 10 weeks because each trade does three and a half. And on average, there is so 35 divided by 3.5. That gives you 10 weeks. There's seven trades in this particular simulation that are represented. So each per they usually have a table and then there'd be seven people and each one represents a trade and each one is rolling the dice. So the first week, the first trade takes 10 weeks. Second trade should finish one week later or week 11, etc. And seventh trade finishes on week 16. Um, so it's going to be longer than 10 weeks to do because you got to wait for each trade to do their work. So basically one trade passes off to the next trade, passes off to the next trade when they get done. So in a perfect world, what would this cost? $245,000. Each trade completes an average of three and a half rooms. Each trade is complete in 10 weeks. Seven trades working each 10 weeks. 3.5 roll times 10 weeks times seven trades, that's 245 total roll. How much capacity your team needs to get all 35 classrooms done on average? Each dot is 1,000, so 240, that's why they use 1,000, it's easy math, 245,000. And then they add in the simulation 15% for um, profit, right? So that's giving you 37,000 plus the 245,000. All right, so they run through this simulation and when they do, they get a lot of variation. You know, people are not rolling three. You can't roll ever roll exactly a three and a half. You're going to roll a three or a four, but it's not. It's it's basically some are rolling ones, some are rolling sixes and so on. So there's a lot of variation. So the project gets held up a lot, right? Somebody rolls a one, but somebody was expecting, you know, to have three and a half classrooms ready and they're not ready for them. So that's going to have a ripple effect that's going to delay um, the project, right? So there's not consistency in the roles. And, you know, what happens on our construction projects? We get a lot of this. You know, we have this plan and then we don't get consistency. We don't get the commitment that we need to do the work in that time period. Um, so what, what does a skilled site super do? The question is asked, right? And you always ask these questions. And there's only so much that you can do in these situations, right? You know, who, who's the culprit? And you want to, that's the blame game, right? You want to blame somebody for this, right? This is their fault. So it's not getting to root cause analysis and things that we would want to do, right? It's just who caused this, right? Not asking the five whys to find out the actual source. And then what do we do? We just throw more people on it, right? We throw more people on it and that'll solve the problem. Uh, Brooks Law is adding more people to an already late project may only make it later. Kind of true, 
may only make it later. Uh, you get so many people there and they start to get in each other's way. Um, you want people to work extra shifts, longer hour. Okay, so we won't have so many on site at each time. We will have people work uh, extra hours. So we'll work 12 hour days and we'll work Saturday and Sunday. You know what? People get burned out. Think of yourself when you work long hours, are you at your best? No, you're tired. You're not getting as much done. And in construction, you're more likely to have an accident too. So from a safety perspective, going back to those constraints, that's not too good either. So that's another problem that occurs, right? So working extra shifts, working weekends, not so great. Um, you know, really sort of why are you so far behind? Again, accusatory uh, with that. And there could be a nth degree of reasons why they're behind. They're missing a part. They don't have the supplies. They don't have the people. They're not working as effectively as they thought they would. Maybe the handoff from the previous trade is requiring some rework. So you can go on and on with that, right? So why are you so far behind? Who's delaying you? Who's this culprit? Uh, maybe you determine, okay, well, we can't do these. Maybe we can offset and we can help them by bringing in uh, some supplemental crew people, right? Or um, maybe we can also replace this trade or a competitor like it says here that we can section off some of the work so that's that might be in the realm of things that typically gets done or you back charge the culprit and that's really where's that going that's going to litigation that's going to um, a lot of uh, problems adversarial relationships and that's part of the problem too with our contract types how we contract the work in that we offer incentives for trades to get in and out quickly and then other trades maybe they're not performing the way they should be and so they're not keeping up to the average and the trades behind them are really upset and again you have all of this adversarial relationships going on so these are some of the problems but really at the root of this is variation you know we're assuming that you're going to do three and a half uh, classrooms per week all right, and we haven't set it up in such a way that we're actually effectively getting that. So when you have more variation, that causes more issues. So that means you got to spend some time reducing the variation. Now, uh, Deming, uh, basic Dr. Deming, uh, who one of the original founders of Lean. Uh, would say with uh, variation, you know, you have two types. You have special cause variation and common cause variation. Well, special cause variation is like these kind of one-off weather events, uh, an unexpected machine breaks down, these types of things. Common cause variation is usually something wrong with your system. And that takes more work to actually fix, but it's also much more common as being the problem, right? Uh, so you really have to start looking at what is going on with the variation and how can you reduce the variation? You're not going to get rid of variation, but you can definitely reduce it. You can offer up buffers to help absorb some of the variation that you have. In Lean, we don't think of buffers as being a great thing, but a necessary thing. But then we work diligently over time to try to reduce the amount of buffers that we may have. And I'll talk about buffers in another section but because you have too big a buffers that's not good right but definitely we need some and some of those buffers will help us from that perspective we'll talk about the three types of buffers in another section as i mentioned so we have some people are rolling fives and sixes ones and twos it's kind of like you got three oars on one side of uh, a kayak or of a canoe and two on the other so it's not going to go in a straight line you're going you're deviating all over the place right and of course when you're deviating it's taking longer than if you went in a straight line so system efficiency will always beat individualist efficiency it's kind of like a really good championship football team basketball team hockey team right if it's if it's just only one person then that's usually not going to win uh, the overall championship yes it may have a superstar on it you you know you might have a lebron james but that lebron james needs to be bringing up the rest of the team for them to win 
And that you see that when they actually, you know, the really great players are able to raise the rest of the team up or they have enough good players that it's complementary and that they can share that load. It's, if it's just one player, it is very difficult because they'll get double teamed, triple teamed, etc. So system efficiency, the system will beat individual assist, uh, efficiency when teams are dependent on one another. And in construction, we really are dependent on one another to effectively finish a project within those constraints and goals, time, cost, quality. Uh, so keep that in mind. So, you know, the super tried to go faster. What we should try to be is more consistent and reliable. So more consistent and reliable. So if we did this again, what should we try to do? Well, we got that dice, that single dice. And so if we were able to remove the variation, or it's not remove it, but lessen it. So, you know, even moving from a one to a six, right, that we don't have ones and sixes, removing those two, that we only rule two, three, four, five, that would improve somewhat the variation. Ideally, if we're able to get it down to, you know, whenever you roll the dice, you can only roll a three or a four, right? You're going to come closer to that three and a half average. You know, you, there is the randomness to it. You know, if you're doing a small amount, you might have a whole bunch more fours than threes, but you're still going to be closer to that three and a half than if you've got a variation as high as one and six. So what do we do to close that variation if it was one trade maybe they just needed an extra person there maybe they needed somebody else to do an extra thing that would make that flow their work flow better it could be a, a number of things that's going on there so you need to narrow that variation so they run the simulation again and this is typical lean training we run it a second time whenever you roll the dice if you roll a one or a two or a three it counts as a three when you roll a four five or six it counts as a four and then you really see, because you track it, in the previous in the previous role when you were allowed to do ones and sixes, very often no one makes money. Sometimes one makes money. Like it depends how many tables you're doing, that sort of thing. But very rarely. Usually nobody's making money. When you do it with threes and fours, it's rare when, when everybody doesn't make money or maybe one doesn't make money, but generally it's pretty, and the one that doesn't is pretty close to making money. So it really dramatically improves your opportunities and your chances by improving the reliability, the consistency. And, you know, there's this uh, Navy SEAL saying that I like to say a lot, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And it's not about, you know, starting out going faster. It's about having a good pace. And at the end of the day, it's like the turtle and the hare. You're going to have a nice, even pace to it. So it's not about speed. It's about reliability. Going back to the triangle, which round would have more safety issues? The first one, because you fall behind, you throw more people at it, right? Like we said, hurry up factor because you know you're late. Uh, you know, I used to do a shop class uh, years ago and teach shop. And I was always a bit nervous near the end of the semester because you get students that maybe they were a little bit, uh, let's just say, um, not as energetic as others or they missed a number of classes. They'd show up on the last class and want to just throw everything together. And that's when an accident's going to happen. So you had to be really careful about that they're not going to cause an accident or hurt themselves, right? Uh, losing money not working as efficiently with big crews trying to make up time in round one so yeah that's that's for sure clutter material stacked up as they're backed up you fall behind you bring in more people they need more materials where you put the materials they're all in the way and that has a big impact and that's one of the areas of waste right in lean construction inventory and transportation where are we placing it what's the timing of the deliveries and how much are we having brought in uh, a lot of unused capacity workers waiting for work and work waiting for uh workers that should say workers right so we don't want that uh to occur we want to have that much better we're going a little bit slower but more smoothly and we don't have these stops and starts and these ripple effects there's a lot of loss going on with variation if you're behind and i know this firsthand you know and basically then if you got to finish all these little odds and ends 
and the school is open, well, that's kind of a nightmare. You know, you've got the place occupied. It's going to take you three times as long. You've got to worry about the public, the kids, safety, all of these other things. And longer schedules, well, it means a lot of things. It means there's a per diem cost. Every day you're on your project, it costs so much. Longer exposure to risk. There's a lot of things that go on the longer your project goes. Um, so that's not great. So as a summary, workflow is the progression of work within a trade or from one trade to another. And that's getting those handoffs smooth and not having work wait for workers, right? Somebody gets way ahead and now it sits there or workers waiting for work. Somebody's not, not finishing when they should and you've got a bunch of workers there and they can't do what they need to do. To improve total system performance, we must improve throughput of the system, not just improve the individual pieces. Point speed is not the answer. Having a pile of work in progress is not helpful, right? You want to minimize the amount of work in progress. You want to have a good steady flow and workflow and throughput through the system is what's important. So we, how do you do that? One of the big ways is reducing workflow variation. And by reducing variation, it makes your project outcomes more predictable. It simplifies the coordination between the trades. Everybody knows what they need to do. There's clarity there. You have the right loading and capacity to do the work. You have buffers in place that can absorb any of the minor variations. So it's not interrupting the overall flow of work. And that will also, at that point, reveal any new opportunities for improvement as you're monitoring it closely. So going back, we want to have time, cost, quality, scope, safety. We want to go for all of them. We don't want to just go for two out of three. That's not what we're after. We're trying to satisfy all those areas. And if you know me and you've seen some of my other videos, you know I pull this up a fair bit because I really think it enhances thought from a 30,000 foot view on how projects run. You have your, you know, I, I talked about these wayfinders who populated the um, uh, Pacific Ocean, Hawaiian Islands, a lot of uh, Fiji and other islands in the Pacific. And they basically, before there was GPS or compass or anything, any of this stuff, uh, they learned how to navigate the ocean, understand the wind currents, uh, basically understand weather patterns, uh, really good at reading the stars for how to um, navigate their, their boats. And so they would have the home island and then they would have the destination island. And they would develop a plan, much like you do in a construction project. So this is where I believe it's very similar to a construction project. You have a goal, a vision, where you want to take it, right? And that's tying to the time, cost, quality, safety, scope that we we're talking about. You develop an overall plan. You know what? This plan is not going to go the way you expect, but you have a baseline, an expectation. Uh, so you have your drawings, you have a good visualization of what you're trying to accomplish. You develop this baseline. And you know what? The wayfinders would have the plan too. And they would start out and they're lost at sea a little bit. They've gone off course. But they're not really lost because they're able to figure out where they are. And essentially, you know, they're, this might take place over a period of a month. But really short term, and this is where lean construction, last planner systems and other methodologies can be really helpful here that differentiates from traditional in that you can take a overall master schedule, which going into it, you know, you've set, developed milestones, you collaborated with this. Uh, the milestones have become important. And then from the milestones, you can, you can have a pull plan or a phase plan. Um, to the first milestone date. Then you can set up a make ready plan, which might be like four weeks or six weeks, very often six weeks, and then weekly, and then daily. You're looking for information so that you can learn on that information and make adjustments and make iterations to your schedule. And so what you're constantly trying to do is course correct. And as you'll see, you know, you go through this whole project over a period of time, it's constant course corrections. That is what you're doing, it's constant iterations. But as I said, that's a long time for learning to take place. 
we want to shorten that, right? So we want to be learning on a weekly basis, where are we deviating? Why did we deviate? And not only on a weekly basis, we want to learn on a daily basis so that that feedback loop is quick and it's short and so that we reduce the variation, right? We don't want to have a lot of variation. The more we reduce the variation, the better off we are. If we don't pay attention to these things, we tend to go off course like a lot of projects and different ocean we're kind of like the titanic and we hit the iceberg and the project sinks right that's not what we want to do in our construction project so this is one methodology that is part of a holistic whole of things that you need to look at and think about but variation is something that's key there and if you think about construction and where it's been advancing it's really been advancing at reducing variation through things like building information modeling that can lead to excellent 3d models that can lead to because you have more surety of what's going to happen and it's going to be built that can lead to more prefabrication lean design so you involve like tools like set based design in the design process where there's collaboration that's going on between the key trades the consultants the owner and the gc to help again remove and reduce variation. So essentially these new technologies and methodologies that we're talking about are in essence trying to reduce variation. So over time there is this continuous improvement towards reducing variation. If you reduce variation you improve predictability and reliability and that is really good so then we don't have 70 percent of projects over budget and over cost probably like 90 percent plus now with just coming out of covid right um, so look at that think about that think about how that can help you in your careers and in better managing your projects and improving the flow so I'm Tom Stevenson. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please click the subscribe button, click notifications for future videos. And if you have any questions, leave a comment. Hope to see you next time. Bye for now.